As record temperatures hit the UK, talk of environmental crackdowns heat up. Prince Harry tells the UN that the right is destroying democracy in America. And the undersecretary of Joe Biden's Health and Human Services Department says it's time to empower young people to change their gender. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. I talk about them every single show. Why haven't you gotten a VPN yet? Get ExpressVPN right now at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Well, folks, you may have noticed that right now the American public is being pinched by stupid leftist policies. I mean, we're always being pinched by stupid leftist policies, but it really hurts right now. It turns out that America's energy policy, for example, that was a bad idea because now your gas costs a fortune. Well, here is the thing. There are certain areas in life where you should be able to cut costs fairly easily. One of those places is your cell phone bill. You should check out Pure Talk. Pure Talk will give you the same talk, text, plenty of data that you need for just 30 bucks a month no price increase. I'm a PureTalk customer. They are the most reliable network in America. They have great 5G coverage. Plus, they're a veteran-owned company with a customer service team based right here in the United States. Stop giving your money away to Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. Switch to my guys over at PureTalk. They make it super easy with a no-risk money-back guarantee. Head over to puretalk.com, select a plan, enter promo code Shapiro, save 50% off your very first month today. You can literally be switched over to PureTalk service in less than 10 minutes. I did it for myself. I did it for my mom, my dad. Go to puretalk.com, enter promo code Shapiro right now. Pure Talk, I get the same great 5G coverage as the big guys. They're using the same cell phone tower as the big guys. They're just not going to charge you an arm and a leg, and they don't hate you ideologically. So why not head on over to puretalk.com, select that plan, enter promo code Shapiro, save 50% off your first month today. Well, the big news in all of the world media outlets is that it's really, really hot over in Europe right now. Yeah, you always know that it's the slow season news-wise when you start getting weather reports from Europe. But apparently, this is big news because it got really, really hot in Paris and really, really hot in the UK. Now, the thing that they will never tell you, the media, is that more people die of cold every year than die of heat every year. But the cold narrative doesn't tend to play into the climate change narrative that they wish to promulgate, right? The, the narrative that they want is that the world is getting warmer every year. And this is why you must listen to our extraordinarily reductive arguments about climate change and why you must listen to our extraordinary burdensome, our extraordinarily burdensome takes on what exactly we must do to end climate change. It's really, really important. So according to the Washington Post, an unforgiving heat wave in Western Europe laid bare Monday how extreme temperatures will increasingly challenge everyday life. As dozens of heat records were shattered, key sectors were hobbled, and emergency services confronted spreading wildfires and rising death tolls. Now, one of the rules when it comes to climate change is that you're not supposed to report like this. You're not supposed to report weather as climate. We've been told this one million times. If there's a really big cold snap, and then people on the right say, hey, climate change is not happening. It's actually really cold outside. That is a bad argument because climate is weather over time. Right? So you can't report a singular weather event and then say, this is climate change. What you can do is point to the trend and you can say this trend looks like climate change. But what the media have a bad habit of doing, scientifically speaking, is they say it's really hot outside today, climate change. And then the next day it's really cold. And they're like, that has nothing to do with climate change. And that's why you see the media increasingly reverting to the argument that it's not about global warming. It's about extreme temperatures. In France, according to the Washington Post, officials warned of a heat apocalypse as the temperature soared up to 109 degrees. That's 43 degrees Celsius. France's meteorological service placed a stretch of its Atlantic coast under the highest possible alert level. More than 15,000 people were evacuated amid wildfires in France. Wales also reported a new all-time high. Ireland registered its highest air temperature in more than a century. Britain expected on Tuesday temperatures of up to 106 degrees, far above the record of 101.7 degrees set in 2019. British authorities declared a national emergency and for the first time issued a red extreme heat warning for large parts of England as the nation struggled to adapt. In London, workers wrapped the historic Hammersmith Bridge over the River Thames in silver insulation foil to protect the cast iron spans from cracking. Transit officials advised passengers to stay away and ordered trains to slow down as maintenance crew were on the lookout for steel tracks bending and buckling. Planes were diverted from at least two airports amid reports of melting runways and roads. Penny Endersby, the chief operating officer of the Met Office, the United Kingdom's weather service, called the forecast temperatures absolutely unprecedented. Our lifestyles and our infrastructure are not adapted to what is coming, said Endersby. The heat has been pumped into Europe by a zone of low pressure cut off from atmospheric steering currents west of Portugal. The counterclockwise flow around this low pressure zone has drawn hot air from northern Africa directly into Western Europe. After peaking in Western Europe on Tuesday, heat is expected to envelop Germany and Poland and then rebuild over Southern Europe. Much of Italy's north remains under a state of emergency. Some experts said Europeans are bearing witness to a heat wave unmistakably shaped by human-caused climate change. And this is the reason that you are seeing all of this talk, because the answer that the media would like to provide is that we must therefore listen to Greta. We must therefore end our reliance on carbon-based fossil fuels. Now, here's the reality. Human beings, pretty good at adaptation. Human beings, really bad at prevention. 
This is true in nearly every aspect of how humanity works. It's true fiscally. Human beings do not actually take the measures they need to with regard to, say, for example, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. We all know it's going to be bankrupt by 2030. Doesn't matter. Nobody's going to do anything because the incentive structure is not aligned for people to do something. Instead, they'll let it hit the wall and then they'll make austerity measures. You've seen this in Europe. You've seen it in Greece. You've seen it in Germany. It's happened over and over. And when it comes to things like it's really hot outside and therefore 100 years from now, it might be kind of dangerous. So therefore, we should all stop using cars today. People don't act like that. Instead, they seek to adapt. But what the media want is to report on stuff like this and then suggest that the solution to this is to take hardcore action right now to reduce carbon emissions. Now, one of the big problems here is that carbon emissions are global in nature. China's carbon emissions, still the highest on planet Earth. India is number two. Both the EU and the US have had declining carbon emissions over the course of the last several years. That's not enough. The reality is once the carbon is emitted, it's up there in the atmosphere for something like 10,000 years and it ain't coming down. What that means is that if we were actually realistic about climate change, we would be looking at adaptation-centric solutions. Everyone who studies the science knows this. It's not climate denial to suggest that the solutions being proposed by the left, things like a global carbon tax, are very, very unlikely to happen. We live in a competitive geopolitical sphere. What that means is that China is not likely to sign on to an agreement that it thinks is going to damage China. Unless it also thinks it's going to hobble the United States or something. If you're a developing country, if you're a third world country, are you really going to buy into the idea that you're going to stop your development, which is largely based on the availability of cheap carbon-based fossil fuels in orders that 100 years from now, or even five years from now, the Europeans are going to have a slightly cooler climate? Okay, very unlikely any of that is going to happen, which is why theoretically we should be focused on adaptation-minded solution, namely innovation, things like geoengineering, things like developing new sources of energy in a market-friendly way, right? This would be the stuff that we ought to be pursuing. But nobody's focusing in on that because one of the keys to understanding the modern environmentalist movement is that it is not about preserving the environment for future humans. That's not what it's about. It's an almost anti-human view of how human beings should act on planet Earth. The idea is that human beings should stop technological progress today. They should stop industrial development today. We would all be better off in a sort of You've all know a Harari universe in which we all go back to hunter gathering and lifespans decline again, and we all live in greater balance with nature and the universe. The only problem is that actually does have a tremendous human cost. The sort of romanticization of poverty, the romanticization of lack of progress is a hallmark of the left, and it's really ugly and it's really foolish. It's really nice to think about the idea that if we just stopped progress today, everything would be great for the foreseeable future. That's not correct. And that's particularly not correct, by the way, for the world's poorest countries. That's not correct for places like the entire continent of Africa, for example, which deeply requires economic growth in order to rise from the current levels of poverty that are crippling it. It's very easy for people in westernized developing nations and developed nations to say, oh, well, you know, we've gotten as far as we need to go. What if we just cut down on the development? It's not quite as easy to say that to countries where people are still burning animal dung for fuel, which, by the way, is very bad for the environment. But the Washington Post, again, it's all about the idea that they're going to report this stuff in order not to say, you know what, what if, what if the actual solution right now is, for example, more air conditioning in Europe, right? What if it turns out human beings are good at adaptations? So what, if the, what if the answer is not, we worry about global warming over the course of 100 years as much as it is, you know, it's really hot in France and it's going to kill like 10,000 old people. Why don't we make sure that people have a place to go that is air conditioned? By the way, air conditioning technology, the fact that this is still widely unavailable in places in Europe is a testament to how stupid so many policymakers are. Air conditioning was invented in like the 1920s. It's been around for 100 years. That is the reason, by the way, that people in the 1920s used to go to movie theaters all the time. That was one of the few places that was actually air conditioned. This is a very old technology, air conditioning. So why is it that there's still so many places on planet Earth that don't have the air conditioning? What you need is more economic growth, more economic progress. According to the Washington Post, however, in Europe, the human toll and logistical challenges of extreme heat were becoming increasingly visible with firefighting services under strain, hospitals preparing for increased admissions, and office work and schools disrupted. What you'll notice is that left-wing places don't make the adaptation necessary changes. Instead, what they do is they complain about problems that are likely to manifest over the course of decades. You saw this when there was flooding from hurricanes in, like, New Jersey last year. Everybody's like, oh, global warming is about... Why didn't you harden your infrastructure, guys? You see this in California all the time. I'm from California. And now I move my family to, to Florida, move my company to, to Nashville, Tennessee. When we were in California, every year, like clockwork, there'd be a drought. And every year, like clockwork, there'd be transformers blowing up. And you wouldn't be able to, to get air conditioning for like half the summer. 
because they hadn't replaced any of the infrastructure for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. They built no new dams. They'd not done anything to create desalinization plants. They hadn't done any of the stuff that they would actually need to do to provide water to people. So you're still seeing that every single year in California. And then the newspapers are like, it's very hot this summer in California. Oh, you mean like it has been for all of human history? Yes, it might be hotter this summer than it has been in the past. It was also very hot in the summer in California in 1850. This is nothing new. What you should be doing is actually taking the measures you need to take in order to adapt, but they are not actually doing those things. Instead, the political incentive for the left is not to fix the problem in the here and now, and then to try and create innovation for the future. The political incentive is to say, if only we could be more censorious of people's actions, their economic decisions on a day-to-day level, which really suggests that there's a secondary agenda at work here, and that is greater redistribution of wealth, a low-income, low-growth agenda, that these two things are connected. I think there's a reason why, you know, Sonny Bunch has pointed this out, movie reviewer, that very often you see that in the movies, the only left-wing villains are environmentalists because they're always recommending solutions that are very anti-human. And it's the same sort of thing that is happening right now because it turns out that the environmental policy pursued by the hard left in the name of things like it's really hot in Britain this summer tend to actually be really bad, not only for the people in Europe, but for people all over the world. And well, if the news is designed to make you lose sleep, you shouldn't lose sleep just because your sheet is bad. This is why you need bowl and branch. Bowl and branch sheets, they are the best sheets. I know because I literally have them on all the beds in our house because I took all of our other sheets and I threw them out because once you've gone bowl and branch, you just can't go back. Bowl and branch sheets aren't just buttery, breathable, and insanely comfortable. They get softer with every single wash. Forget thread count. Bowl and branch will give you thread quality because it doesn't matter how many threads your sheets have if they aren't the best threads available. Their signature hem sheets from Bowl and Branch, they are a bestseller for a reason. Bowl and Branch uses the highest quality threads on earth for superior softness and a better night's sleep. These are sheets made with threads so luxurious. They're beloved by three U.S. presidents. They feel buttery to the touch. They're super breathable. They're perfect for every season. They've got over 10,000 stellar reviews. We've reviewed them too because they are just fantastic. They're 100% free from toxins, no pesticides, formaldehyde, or other harsh chemicals. And they fit the deepest of mattresses. Bowling brand sheets, they're made so that they don't like pop off your bed in the middle of the night. Your face is on the mattress like, ah, it's gross and weird. Bowling branch saves you from that. Plus, they give you a 30-night risk-free trial with free shipping and returns on all orders. The annual summer event is starting right now. Bowen Branch is giving my listeners exclusive early access before anyone else to 20% off with promo code Shapiro at bowlandbranch.com. This is their best offer of the year before the holidays. Act right now. That's Bull and Branch, B-O-L-L and branch.com, bowlandbranch.com. Promo code Shapiro for 20% off. According to the Wall Street Journal, same day, right? We're talking about it being really, really hot in Europe and people are recommending that we need to listen to Greta because Greta's judging you. She's judging you. At the same time that they're reporting that, It turns out, quote, Europe fears widespread economic fallout if Russian gas outage drags on. It turns out that when you pursue environmental policy at the cost of actual things happening in the world today, what you end up doing is empowering some of the world's worst human beings, like, for example, Vladimir Putin and the administration over in Russia. According to the Wall Street Journal, as a deadline approaches for Russia to resume supplying natural gas to Germany this week, European officials and executives are growing concerned about a cascading economic fallout that would spread across the continent should Moscow keep the tap shut. The Nord Stream pipeline that ferries gas from Siberia to Germany closed last Monday for annual maintenance that that is expected to last for 10 days. Many in the West fear that Moscow might prolong the closure, possibly permanently, and deprive Germany, Europe's industrial powerhouse, of a key ingredient for its and its neighbors' factories. European leaders blamed Moscow for using gas as a weapon when flows along the pipeline began to ebb last month. Moscow blamed that shortfall on technical issues related to Western sanctions. It's hilarious. So the Europeans are now complaining that they don't have enough Russian oil in the middle of sanctioning Russian oil. And the reason they are dependent on Russian oil, of course, is because they were lying to themselves and to everybody else. We are pursuing green policy, green policy for the future. It's going to make life better for everyone. And then it turns out that dirty, under the table, Russian oil and natural gas are actually powering the economy of countries like Germany. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that instead of having developed their own natural gas resources, their own nuclear power plants, instead, they basically offshored all of their oil and natural gas production to a a giant gas station on the Volga that is run by a dictator with nuclear weapons. Brilliant move. Again, environmental policy that it does not take into account the needs of today is bad policy, period. You actually have to balance the needs for the future with the needs of today. And there are ways out of this. That's, that's the part that's so amazing. And the fact that Europe has turned completely against nuclear energy, the fact that Europe turned against natural gas exploration, despite the fact that, for example, fracking is significantly better for the environment than traditional oil drilling or coal. Now, all of that has been ignored until the last five minutes. 
which is why the European Union, by the way, they just came out and they said that nuclear and natural gas are now going to be considered green sources of energy. So they're trying to backfill the problem. Complicating the calculus, officials and executives say it might not be easy to determine whether Russia is restoring gas flows fully. Under one scenario, Moscow could switch the pipeline back on, but with lower volumes as it already has, citing technical problems linked to the sanctions. On Monday, utility Uniper SE, Germany's biggest buyer of Russian gas, said it had received a letter from Russia's state-owned Gazprom that claims force majeure, a legal declaration that exempts the company from fulfilling contractual obligations due to circumstances outside its control to justify past and current shortfalls in gas deliveries. Germany is highly dependent on Russian gas. It acts as a transit hub for gas headed for, to Europe, to Austria, the Czech Republic, Ukraine. Okay, now, here is one of the big problems here. You know, you think that it's a problem now that they don't have power. Wait till you get to the winter. Wait till you get to the winter. Again, the, the media likes to focus on things being really, really hot. But the simple fact is, when it gets cold in the winter, that's when the pedal's really going to hit the metal. When people don't have the carbon-based energy necessary to heat their homes, a lot of people are going to freeze this winter in places like Germany. A lot of people are going to freeze in France. A lot of people are going to freeze in Ukraine. A lot of people are going to freeze in Eastern Europe because of all of this. Because people, again, pursued bad energy policy in order to apparently avoid a a 100-year future in which some bad things might happen. There's an ideological component to this. There really, really is. And it's an ugly ideological component. The Wall Street Journal has a good opinion piece by the editorial board today talking about the misguided climate regulations that have really wrecked Europe's economy and and the free world's ability to control its own flow of energy. I mean, there's a reason that Joe Biden was over in Saudi Arabia going on bended knee and fist bumping Mohammed bin Salman's, the consternation of the media. You can't have it both ways. If you're a member of the media and you've been calling for hard green policy to cut off America's energy supply, you cannot then whine when Joe Biden goes to the Saudis to supplement our energy supply and is forced to fist bump MBS. You You can't do it. You can't have it both ways. Either develop resources at home or stop bitching about the fact that Joe Biden has to go abroad in order to fist bump MBS. Those are, those are mutually exclusive positions. You cannot hold both that our environmental policy is good and also that Joe Biden should cut off MBS. Not unless you're willing to pay the bills of people who are paying $7, $8 a gallon. According to the Wall Street Journal, consider the costly consequences of misguided climate regulation, subsidies, and mandates. People, even in affluent countries, are learning they can no longer take reliable electric power for granted. Texas's grid operator this month told residents not to use major appliances to avoid rolling blackouts amid a heat wave that brought wind power to a near standstill. Sluggish wind power also contributed to a a week-long power outage amid freezing temperatures in February 2021. It turns out, in fact, that green energy production made these weather events significantly worse in terms of their impact on actual human beings. A third of the nation's coal power, 10% of its nuclear capacity, has shut down over the past decade, owing to stricter environmental regulation and competition from cheap natural gas, as well as heavily subsidized renewables. Natural gas generators have picked up some of the slack, but they are under stress from having to ramp up and down to balance intermittent renewables. Ironically, grid operators are having to keep coal plants scheduled to retire on life support. Super Green California plans to now buy electricity from diesel generators when supply is tight. For those who don't know, diesel generators, not the cleanest form of energy. But California is basically Europe, except on the West Coast of America, meaning that they pursue green policy. And then it turns out somebody else has to supply their energy because they didn't actually do the stuff they need in order to generate that energy. By the way, another hilarious environmental story out of California. So when I was in California, it was a big deal to put solar panels on your roof. It was a big deal. They they paid you to put solar panels on your roof. It turns out the lifespan on those solar panels is now coming to an end. And the big problem is that most people are just taking those and throwing those in the garbage and now seeping into the groundwater. All those heavy metals are seeping into the groundwater. So again, well done. Short-sighted environmental policy. The Wall Street Journal editorial board also points out the rushed green transition is driving up energy prices across the board. Peak time electricity wholesale prices this summer are projected to more than double in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Midwest, according to Energy Information Administration. Blame the left's war on pipelines, which has constrained natural gas production, even as demand grows. Retail consumers in much of the United States have largely been shielded so far because states limit utility rate increases, but average residential electricity prices in Texas's deregulated power markets have climbed 70% over the past year. Americans can look forward to similar increases in the years ahead. Either that or the utilities are just going to go bankrupt because you've destroyed their entire profit motive. And you can look forward to supply shortages. You can look forward to empowering dictators. As the Wall Street Journal says, do Western leaders recognize or care that their climate monomania is endangering living standards in democracies and also empowering authoritarians? Historian Arnold Toynbee argued civilizations die from suicide, not murder. The West's climate self-destruction may prove him right. And as I say, for some people, they're just saying the quiet part out loud. So it's not a coincidence that the same time the New York Times is reporting 
on the heating earth and all the rest of this, that they printed an interview with a with a, an elderly economist whose name is Herman Daly. So this entire interview is predicated on the idea that we should stop growing. Right? According to the New York Times, quote, this pioneering economist says our obsession with growth must end. He says, I'm not against growth of wealth. I think it's better to be richer than poorer. The question is, does growth as currently practiced and measure really increase wealth? Is it making us richer in any aggregate sense? Or might it be increasing costs faster than benefits and making us poorer? Mainstream economists don't have any answer to that. The reason they don't have any answer is they don't measure costs. They only measure benefits. That's what GDP is. There's nothing subtracted from GDP. But the libertarian notion is logical. If you're going to be a libertarian, you can't accept limits to growth. Limits to growth are there, however. I remember Kenneth Boulding said there are two kinds of ethics. There's a heroic ethic and there's an economic ethic. The economic ethic says, wait a minute, there's benefits and costs. Let's weigh the two. We don't want to charge right over the cliff. Let's look at the margin. Are we getting better or worse? The heroic ethic says, hang the cost full speed ahead, death or victory right now, forward into growth. He says that um, he doesn't have faith that the future is going to learn how to deal with the problems. And herein lies the rub. For a lot of people on the left, the idea is that we have reached the end of progress. It's time to redistribute the gains. And we need to freeze things in place as they are. You get this with regard to the climate. You get this with regard to the status of politics. And everything has to sort of be frozen the way that it is because change is inherently bad. But the things they want to change are, of course, the things that are most basic to human civilization, right? Family structure, marriage, basics of male versus female. Right? Those are the things they want to change. But we need to freeze the economy where it is because that allows them top-down control. The New York Times quotes this economist saying, it's a false assumption to say that growth is increasing the standard of living in the present world because we measure growth as growth in GDP. If it goes up, does that mean we're really increasing the standard of living? We've said it does, but we've left out all the cost of increasing the GDP. We really don't know that the standard is going up. If you subtract for deaths and injuries caused by automobile accidents, chemical pollution, wildfires, and many other costs induced by excessive growth, it's not clear at all. Um, no, it actually is really, really clear. I promise you, the invention of the automobile has been far more of a net benefit to humanity than the number of accidents that have occurred. But this guy wants to make ecological room. He says that we need an empty world full of natural resources that had not been exploited. The full world is now full of people that exploit those resources. This is a, a radical anti-human ethos. And it's being pursued by people who generally are, are not a fan of growth. And that's a real problem, particular for people. Again, this sounds very nice to people who live in um, nice mansions in nice areas of the country. For everybody else, it sounds pretty bad. Now, what's amazing about all of this is that these so-called experts on the environment who want to pursue this kind of environmental policy, this sort of blunt instrument, kill economic growth, outsource all your problems to dictators who don't care about environmental hazards and all the rest, that kind of expertise is not expertise, it's stupidity. But there are actual scientific experts out there who are largely being ignored right now doing amazing work. So, for example... It is quite possible that within the next 10 years, we are going to have a source of energy that is basically going to end carbon-based fossil fuels nearly entirely. Remember, the vast majority of carbon-based fossil fuel use on planet Earth has nothing to do with automobiles. It has to do with heating. It has to do with industry. It has to do with a bunch of other things that are not cars, which is why it was so stupid for all of Europe and the United States to basically decommission all the nuclear power plants. But great piece by Khaled Talat over a tablet. It turns out that there is a form of energy that people have been attempting to sort of crack the code on for a very long time. And we may be growing closer and closer to that. And that is nuclear fusion. So a nuclear power plant runs on nuclear fission. A nuclear fission is where you break apart a molecule. And in breaking apart the molecule, you end up actually generating a lot of energy. A, a nuclear fission bomb is where you split the atom. A lot of energy is released, exponentially more energy than was put into it just by splitting the atom. Okay, however, nuclear fusion is what, for example, the sun does. And that is where it takes two atoms of, say, hydrogen, and it squishes them together until they become helium. And that generates also exponential energy, like way more than nuclear fission. So nuclear fusion has always been sort of the holy grail of energy generation. I mean, considering that it literally heats our planet, right? The sun is a nuclear fusion machine. So fusion has always been the thing people are hunting. And it seems that we are now growing closer to that, right? Shouldn't we be pouring resources into that? If you want to talk about innovation, if you want to talk about the kind of stuff that maybe government should invest in if we're worried about energy, why are we investing in like solar panels and wind farms? That's dumb. Why don't we invest in actual innovative techniques that could revolutionize the entire way the energy markets work all over the planet? We are talking about essentially the generation of extraordinary amounts of nearly free energy all over the planet, if you could crack this code. This piece over at Tablet Magazine says the 21st century may one day be known 
more than anything else for the period when human beings transition from fossil fuels to clean renewable energy. Such a transition, as we know even now, is crucial to sustaining our physical environment. Debates have been raging around the role that nuclear fusion might play in this transition. Last February, the jet reactor in the United Kingdom broke the record for the amount of energy produced per pulse. Last year, the experimental advanced superconducting tokamak, EAST, in China broke the record for highest plasma temperature achieved in a tokamak. You have to have really, really high temperatures in order to squish the, the, the atoms together so as to create the, the externality of energy being produced. Such developments stir up ex enormous excitement about a potential epoch-making breakthrough in fusion technology. Media reports and press releases on individual developments in fusion, however, often fail to provide a bird's-eye view of the field, exaggerating progress or selling fusion as a magical, unlimited source of energy, not bound by the engineering or economic limitations of other forms of energy. The truth is, there are multiple approaches to fusion simultaneously being pursued. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Fusion reactions are thermonuclear reactions, which means they occur at the level of the nucleus, unlike chemical reactions, which occur at the level of electrons, and they are triggered by thermal conditions. That means you require very, very high temperatures, essentially. When two nuclei collide with each other, they can repel each other or they can fuse together. As repulsive electrostatic forces act on the longer range, fusion occurs if the colliding positively charged nuclei are fast enough to overcome the repulsive barriers and penetrate to the range of the attractive strong nuclear force interaction and if they try enough times until they fuse. The number of fusion reactions within a given time period for particular reactants multiply substantially with increased temperature and increased packing or density as the nuclei are faster and more likely to collide when they are closer together. It is possible, although not a likely outcome at the level of a single interaction, that a slow collision between the barrier energy can result in fusion as the reactions are quantum and mechanical in nature. So there's being a lot of, of investment in this. There should be more investment in this, but what this comes down to is, do you have faith that the advance of science is going to solve a lot of our problems? Now, what, what is amazing is that all the people who say that they love science so much, they don't seem to have a lot of faith in science. They don't seem to have a lot of faith in innovation. That is the actual thing that science does, right? It's not just that science can measure the changing temperature over time. Climate models are very often wrong because this is really complicated stuff. It's not just people falsifying data or being willful. This is difficult stuff. But what science is really good at is inventing new, amazing things. Why would you count on human beings suddenly exercising self-control as a species as opposed to innovating in new and in, in, in amazing ways. That's the thing you should actually be betting on. The left doesn't want to bet on that. Instead, what the left would like to do is generate policy in the here and now that makes people suffer to no apparent end. Because by the way, all the measures that they are taking right now, Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreements, that ain't going to do diddly squat in the long run when it comes to whatever carbon emissions are being put up into the atmosphere and what is going to stay there. Now, that's not going to stop our idiot elites like Prince Harry from talking about things like climate change. So Prince Harry, for some reason, is now speaking at the UN. Um, I don't know why. He, he's, he's the son who wasn't good enough to stay in the family. He's the one who married Meghan Markle and then proceeded to alienate himself from the entire royal family and then come to the United States. And I was under the impression we fought a revolution so we didn't have to listen to dolts like Prince Harry. I thought that was the whole point. We didn't want a royal family over here because then you have moron inbred royals explaining to us exactly how the world ought to work while being bossed around by their significantly more vocal spouses. I, 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 I don't think anybody was particularly interested in this, but the Duke of Sussex decided that he was going to appear at the United Nations. I will say that it was pretty hilarious that no one showed up for the speech. If you actually watch the speech, there's no one in the audience. Even the UN, which like you're being paid to listen to crap speeches, even they were like, no, I can't do it, man. I'm going to go get myself a parking ticket. I'm never going to pay. Apparently, at this event, he talked a lot about climate change. He highlighted the havoc of it. And he said, how many of us feel battered, helpless in the face of a seemingly endless stream of disasters and devastation? Uh, here is Prince Harry, who, uh, why, why, just, just why, here he is. This has been a painful year in a painful decade. We're living through a pandemic that continues to ravage communities in every corner of the globe. Climate change wreaking havoc on our planet, with the most vulnerable suffering most of all. The few weaponizing lies and disinformation at the expense of the many. And from the horrific war in Ukraine to the rolling back of constitutional rights here in the United States, we are witnessing a global assault on democracy and freedom the cause of Mandela's life. He's a, he's, a, 
he's talking about Demo he's a member of the he's only famous because he's a member of a royal family. Find a better spokesperson, people. He's literally famous because he was born into a family that is like pure aristocratic hierarchy happening right there. He's literally a member of a monarchic family explaining why democracy is being threatened because of Roe versus Wade being overturned. And then he's jabbering about the effects of climate change. Like he knows anything about climate change. Yeah, Prince Harry's the expert. That guy. He, oh my goodness. He, he's just become worse and worse. The, the Meghan Markle thing. I'm with Piers Morgan. Large scale mistake for our neighbors across the sea. Him talking about the world being on fire again. He says, he says, these historic weather events are no longer historic. More and more, they are part of our daily lives, and this crisis will only grow worse. Oh, he, he lives on a giant estate in California with his B-level actress wife, who married into a royal family to become a princess and then whined about it for years on end, claiming that everyone was racist to after the entire British press talked about how wonderful she was, specifically because of her intersectional identity. These are the people who are deciding policy. It's people like Prince Harry. They're no smarter than Prince Harry. They're, they're no wiser than Prince Harry. They're all just kind of like Prince Harry. They're sort of a hereditary upper class that have decided for everyone else that you don't get the air conditioning because the air conditioning, you know, it might contribute to future global warming. You're like, wait, wait, it's really hot outside it now. I need the air conditioning today. Like, well, you know what? We can't, we can't let you have oil and natural gas because 100 years from now, there might be incremental increase in the temperature that will cause mass migration. And they're like, there's mass migration right now because of a giant war happening between Russia and Ukraine that is resulting in widespread devastation, not just in the region, but also globally because of the skyrocketing price of food. That's causing migration crisis now, today. And you have our, our sort of elite class, the, the Prince Harry group, who are still making this case. And we're supposed to listen to them. And this sort of scorn drips from the people who believe that it's their job to rule others. There's an op-ed from, from a woman named Margaret Renkel, a contributing opinion writer, who covers flora, fauna, politics, and culture in the American South, which is a hell of a beat. I don't know how you get flora and fauna and politics. Like, oh, wow, you know, the lady who's really good at gardening. Let's get her take on, on the latest election down South. So she has a piece in the New York Times today titled, Dear Liberals, Come On Down. And she's not making the case that the liberal people should move to Nashville because Nashville is a great place to live. She's making the case that Nashville is a hellhole. So we need to come in and conquer Nashville from the outside. No, thank you. In fact, we moved our entire company to Nashville to avoid people like you. That was the whole idea. You think people are moving down to Florida, moving down to the American South because they want to hear from the same liberals who they are attempting to escape right now? They just follow people around shouting at them. They're the hall monitors of of planet Earth, these folks. It's like everybody just wants to stay away from them. They're following you around, trying to give you a, a, some sort of detention card. It's amazing. So she has an entire piece about how terrible the South is, but you should come down here and help her make it not terrible again. She says, red state legislators have perfected the art of voter suppression, which you probably know. They haven't, by the way. They've also gerrymandered the South's blue cities into political irrelevance, which you may not. Well, I mean, gerrymandering has happened at every level. There has been no net gain for Republicans versus Democrats nationally this year. Come help us grow, says this liberal. The new gerrymandered district lines are based on current data. With your help, we can outwit craven GOP calculations about where residents reliably vote Republican. Once you're here, you can help us register voters in disenfranchised communities and help drive them to the polls on election day. Changing what happens in red states is the surest way to change what happens in Congress. But railing on social media from your blue state won't change a thing down here. If you want to change Joe Manchin's mind about climate change, you'll need to move to West Virginia. Yeah, good luck with this. Good luck. Yeah. The, the the dripping scorn that so many people in this sort of particular coterie of humanity have for the rest of humanity while wanting to rule them is truly, you can't, you can't govern the people you hate. You can't govern people you think are idiots. You can't govern people who you treat with utter disdain and say to them, we're going to make your life actively worse today in pursuit of some glorious utopia in the future. You can't do that. And then when you fail, claim that people are somehow, it's their fault that you failed. Okay, in just, one sp in just one second, speaking of the expert class, the expert class have a particular view when it comes to social politics that is bewildering to the vast majority of Americans, but you're not allowed to say it. Shh, 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 shh. Well, folks, this week we are celebrating the first anniversary of our podcast, Morning Wire. You love it. It's one of the highest rated podcasts in America. 
one of the highest-rated news podcasts for sure, because it brings you the news every single morning, 15 minutes or less, what you need to know happening in the world. It's sort of our answer to the New York Times of the Daily without all the left-wing bias. Check out Morning Wire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Daily Wire Plus, or wherever you listen to podcasts while you're at it. Check out the rest of our great shows at dailywireplus.com. We're talking about everything Jordan Peterson related under the sun. We are talking about brand new content from Dennis Prager. We're talking about the Matt Walsh Show, the Candace Owens Show, and so much more. Head on over to dailywireplus.com today. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. Now, as you know, for the past several days, I've been talking about how the elite class is blowing everything, and then they combine that with the system of morality, which also shows that they hate you. And that combo is a loser. It is a loser in America. It is a loser globally. It is a loser everywhere. This administration, the Biden administration, they're pursuing the kind of environmental policy the New York Times would like them to pursue, which has resulted, by the way, in massively increased gas prices. That spike began when Joe Biden took office. The Biden administration now trying to brag that prices have come down in the last month or so. So let me get this straight. When the prices go up, it's Putin's price hike. But when they go down, it's because Joe Biden is good at this somehow. Wouldn't it be, Vladimir, shouldn't we give credit to Vladimir Putin? After all, It'd be presumably Vladimir Putin's policy that changed things because Joe Biden's hasn't changed a single thing. Well, you combine that with the scorn that the upper crust elite in the United States have for the morality of everybody else, and you end up with a losing hand, politically speaking. But they can't back off of it, and they won't back off of it, which is how you end up with the Undersecretary for Health and Human Services, Dr. Rachel Levine, who is a biological man, explaining that we need to, quote unquote, empower kids to go on puberty blockers. Empower kids to go on puberty blockers, says a biological man with gender dysphoria who like this is by the way his only qualification for being in office he was not good at being the secretary of health and human services in pennsylvania he was so bad in pennsylvania that when they had a nursing home crisis they had the same exact issues as new york they were shipping old people back to nursing homes that had covid he was taking his own mother out of the nursing home the exact same time then they're like this guy sounds this woman sounds amazing let's pluck him from obscurity in pennsylvania and make him undersecretary for health and human services so here is um, our brilliant Undersecretary for Health and Human Services, Rachel Levine, explaining that kids need to go on puberty blockers. Trans youth are, are vulnerable, um, and they suffer significant harassment and bullying, uh, sometimes in schools or in their community. They have more mental health issues, but there's nothing inherent with being transgender or gender diverse, which would predispose youth to depression or anxiety. It is that harassment and bullying. Now they're suffering politically motivated attacks through state uh, actions against these vulnerable transgender youth. This is not based upon data. This is these are these are, these actions are politically motivated. And so we really want to to to, to base our treatment and and, uh, and to uh, affirm and to uh, support and empower these youth not to limit their participation in activities and sports and even uh, uh, limit their ability to get gender affirmation treatment in their state. Okay, this is a sick and perverse ideology directly at odds with basic human biology, basic human reason, science, and nearly the entire of, of the entirety of humanity today as well as throughout human history. First of all, when Dr. Rachel Levine suggests that there is no, no consonance between LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign ampersand tilde identity, and depression and suicidal ideation, that that just doesn't exist, that that's only bullying. There is, z let me explain, zero data to back that. I don't mean there's some data to back, I mean there is zero data to back that. The best you can say is that there might be some data to suggest exacerbation of an underlying association between these things, exacerbation. But we don't know to what degree it's exacerbated considering you can go to San Francisco where everybody is extraordinarily tolerant of LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign ampersand hashtag emoji identity. And yet the suicidal ideation rates and depression rates are still off the charts for this particular group of people. So that's just a lie. It's not true. But based on that, you now have the Undersecretary for Health and Human Services saying, and I have to say, this is an evil thing to say, that it empowers youth to have them, quote, gender affirmed. That it empowers young people, like an 11-year-old, to say, you know what? You think that you're a girl. You actually are a girl. And probably what you should do is have hormone treatments that permanently damage your body. And then if you go far enough, we should permanently sterilize you and we should perform a surgery on you, mutilating your genitals. This is somehow empowerment. We've come a long way on the empowerment front, it seems. But this is elite morality. Now, I think most elites in American society, most people who are in the upper crust, they don't believe this stuff. They don't believe it for one second. I know because I talk to many of them. I'm friends with many of them. They don't believe this stuff. 
They know they're supposed to say it because when they say it, it means that they are tolerant. And really what it means is they are attacking traditional values. And those traditional values are, of course, very bad. Like the real problem is if you bring your kid to church, if you bring your kid to a 4th of July parade, you bring your kid to church, you are, the, that's scary. That's really, really bad stuff. But it makes you a great parent and it makes society a much better place if you tell little girls that they can be little boys and vice versa. It's empowerment. It's so much empowerment that schools should be instructed to transition your kids socially without you even knowing about it. This is what the elite class say. Now, in the privacy of their homes, do they actually believe this stuff? Behind closed doors, when they talk with one another, do they actually believe that boys can become girls and girls can become boys and that men who believe that they are women are actually women? Of course they don't because they're not complete fools. They just believe that they can get away with nearly anything because after all, they are the upper crust elite and they can change reality to meet all of their demands of reality. And the Biden administration is staffed with tons of people like this for whom the core priority is quote unquote empathy. And by empathy, they don't mean giving people the health care they need. What they mean by empathy is however you identify yourself in any given moment must thus be cheered and celebrated by society and anything less is a form of cruelty. This is what they actually believe, which presumably is why, according to Breitbart, the Biden administration's CDC is promoting an activist organization that seeks to embed leftist gender theory in the classroom. The CDC LGBT Youth Resources page directs teachers to access educator resources from the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, GLSN, a left-wing organization that seeks to embed gender theory into America's classrooms. Look for ways to support Ally Week, No Name Calling Week, or Day of Silence. Interested in finding ways to bring LGBTQ visibility into your curriculum? You've come to the right place, says the GLSEN website. The organization continues by noting the guides can be used to direct activism and embed ideological positions into school curricula when it says GLSEN's education team has created educator guides for each of our days of action. The Biden administration is really, really into this stuff. And so is the entire elite woke left. I mean, they have decided to, to engage in this particular battle mainly because fealty in this battle demonstrates true fealty. If the idea of all group membership is that you have to have some skin in the game, you have to perform some sort of religious ritual, for example, to be a member of religion, you have to, you have to do something on behalf of your team in order to be considered a member of the team. The ultimate sacrifice that you make in order to be a member of the elite left is to sacrifice your reason on the altar of things like gender ideology, so sophisticated that only the brilliant gender theorists at Harvard can explain it, even if they can't tell Matt Walsh what exactly a woman is. Which is how you end up with, by the way, trans swimmer Leah Thomas being nominated for the NCAA Woman of the Year Award. You guys excited? This is how good men are at everything. We are so good at everything. The patriarchy is so clever that we now have men winning, winning the NCAA Woman of the Year Award. I mean, this dude has only purportedly been a woman for like five minutes and he's already the best woman. That's how good men are. Men aren't just the best at being men. They're the best at being women also. It's unbelievable how good they are. Right? Leah Thomas, who is a biological dude who is twice the size of the women that he is racing against, also happens to be the greatest woman in world history, according to the NCAA, according to NBC News. Thomas competed on the Penn's men team for three years before transitioning and moving to the women's team, setting multiple program records. By the way, by transitioning, we don't mean that this person actually had all the surgeries. That has not happened yet. Her eligibility had come under considerable scrutiny, including from several Penn teammates. The NCAA said member schools nominated a total of 577 graduating student athletes. Each school can recognize up to two female athletes. Thomas had been nominated for swimming and diving in Division I. The Women of the Year Selection Committee will select 10 student athletes from each of the three NCAA divisions. The winner will be named at the NCAA convention in January in San Antonio. And man, we look forward for, we, I, I look forward to Leah Thomas accepting the NCAA Women of the Year on behalf of men everywhere. That'd be really exciting. By the way, the fallout from this stuff is so predict predictable and insane and stupid. It really is amazing. So, for example, according to NJ.com, a transgender inmate who impregnated two women while incarcerated at Edna Mahan Correctional Facility for Women has been moved to a new facility, according to the Department of Corrections. Demi Minor, 27, was transferred to Garden State Youth Correctional Facility, a prison for young adult offenders in Burlington County last month, according to Dan Sparaza, Department of Corrections spokesman. He said the DOC, the Department of Corrections, moved Minor to the vulnerable unit at the facility, and she is currently the only woman prisoner on the site. Speraza said he could not comment on the DOC's specific housing actions in Minor's case because of policies around privacy. According to the Corrections Department, Minor is serving a 30-year sentence for manslaughter and is eligible for parole in 2037. Neither she nor her attorney could be reached for comment Friday. 
But a July 5th post on Miner's website claims correction officers forcibly removed her from Edna Mahan and beat her during a transfer to Garden State Youth Correctional Facility. The news of Miner's transfer comes nearly three months after NJ Advanced Media reported that Miner impregnated two women during consensual sexual relationships. By the way, the miracles of gender theory. I mean, what a miracle. I never, I never really particularly thought that a woman could impregnate another woman because that's the stupidest thing in the entire world. Literally, there is nothing possible. You could not say a stupider thing than, than a woman impregnating another woman. It's not possible to say anything stupider than that. But this is now what our entire media proclaims. And to prove it, we will put men in correctional facilities with women and then pretend that we are shocked when their female penises somehow generate children. This is, it, it's, it's an astonishing, wow. What a great woman. But I mean, a historic woman, truly. I mean, ha, these women are so good at being women that they can actually generate sperm cells that impregnate other women and still be women. Like the most magical women of all time. It's all, it's all insane. By the way, one final story on this topic because it's just impossible not to laugh at this story because it's hysterically funny. So apparently, there have now been calls. I'm not kidding. There have now been calls for anthropologists to stop labeling the corpses that they find, like skeletons that they find thousands of years later by either male or female. Not kidding. According to the College Fix, as soon as ancient human remains are excavated, archaeologists begin the work of determining a number of traits about the individual, including ace, age, race, and gender. But a new school of thought within archaeology is pushing scientists to think twice about assigning gender to ancient human remains. It's possible to determine whether a skeleton is from a biological male or female using objective observations based on size and shape of the bones. Critical forensic detectives do it frequently in their line of work, but gender activists argue scientists cannot know how an ancient individual identify themselves. Canadian master's degree candidate Emma Palladino said, quote, you might know the argument that the archaeologists who find your bones one day will assign you the same gender you had at birth. So regardless of whether you transition, you can't escape your assigned sex. But, said Palladino, this is bull bleep. Labeling remains male or female. It's rarely the end goal of any excavation anyway, wrote Palladino. The bioarchaeology of the individual is what we aim for, factoring in absolutely everything we discover about a person into a nuanced, open-ended biography of their life. She is not alone. Gender activists have now formed a group called the trans Doe Task Force to explore ways in which current standards in forensic human identification do a disservice to people who clearly do not fit the gender binary. We propose a gender expansive approach to human identification by combing missing and unidentified databases looking for contextual clues, such as des decedents wearing clothing culturally coded to a gender other than their assigned sex. We maintain our own database of missing and unidentified people who we have determined may be transgender or gender variant. So we are now supposed to believe that if you uncover a skeletal remain from cavemen days, maybe that, maybe Grog over here was actually Grogina and, uh, and, and was cross-dressing and thinking that he was a very female woman with his very female caveman junk. According to Professor Jennifer Raff, University of Kansas, she published, I, I, I don't mean to assume her gender, but, but she's a woman. She published a story called Origin, a genetic history of the Americas, in which she argued there are, quote, no neat divisions between physically or genetically male or female individuals. None. Raff suggested scientists can't know the gender of a 9,000-year-old biologically Peruvian hunter because they don't know whether the hunter identified as male or female. A duality, she says, that was imposed by Christian colonizers. Um, what? So male and female, which exists in literally all mammalian species, is now created by Western colonizers? I mean, first of all, if Western colonizers did actually promote that idea, good for the Western colonizers, because that's like just what all of human reproduction relies on. So I'm, I'm sorry if that comes as breaking news to people, but it's true for the, it's, it's true for the giraffes and it's true for us. It's true for all of us. But apparently that is, that is also a Western invention. It's all Western invention. So it has now invaded all the sacrosanct spaces, including science. So just remember, all the people who say that they are in favor of the science, they actually are not counting on scientific innovation to solve our problems. They actually are not in favor of great scientific minds applying their knowledge to solving really, really important human problems through the creation of new and amazing things. Instead, they've decided that they are going to overthrow science in favor of bad environmental policy, bad gender policy, bad everything policy, because they know better, because they know better. And, um, and then they wonder why everybody looks at them and thinks that they are some of the most well-educated idiots on planet Earth. All righty, we'll be back here later today with additional content. In the meantime, make sure 
that you go check out the Matt Wall Show. It airs 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to check it out at dailywireplus.com. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Bradford Carrington. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Wydowski. Associate producer, Savannah Dominguez-Morris. Editor, Adam Saievitz. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup artist and wardrobe, Fabiola Cristina. Production coordinator, Jessica Kranz. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. On The Matt Wall Show, we talk about the things that matter, real issues that affect you, your family, our country, not just politics, but culture, faith, current events, all the fundamentals. If they matter to you, come check out the show. 